Welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen. And today, we are going to kind of move on a little bit from the history of the Roman Empire to start asking the question of kind of why it all worked, right? Why was the Roman Empire able to be so successful for so long, right? After 100 years of civil, bloody civil war, right, at the end of the Republic, Rome moves into this incredibly peaceful period in time, and they're able to maintain that peace for at least two centuries. So what we're going to look at today is essentially how and why that is able to happen. So let's bring down the lights, bring down the projector, fire this thing up for lecture 14.1, explaining the Roman Empire. So we're going to talk through a few announcements here. We're going to recap where we were previously in terms of kind of going through the history of the Roman Empire. And then what we'll spend most of our time on today is explaining kind of some of the reasons behind why the Roman Empire was successful. That will be our main plan. Now, if we have time at the end, we'll spend a little bit of time kind of going on to talk about what happens next in terms of uh, once we get through the Pax Romana. And once that kind of success begins to wane and things become problematic, um, we will talk about that either at the end of today or we will save that. Uh, for our next lecture. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, we have actually got a lot of announcements today. Uh, you guys know the basic ones, right? Put this thing in speaker view, email, or uh, send a message to your TA uh, if you've got a question here. But the other big announcements, um, one, start your final project. All right, these things are due uh, a week from Friday. And so I want you to get started on that as soon as you can. Um, two, no class on Wednesday. Okay, that is one of the reading days. It is also, if you remember, Rome's birthday. So go out and get yourself like a giant pizza for lunch or something like that. Um, and give a little toast to the ancient Roman uh, Empire. And then what we're going to do on Friday, I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, Friday is going to be an optional class. Okay, so everybody is going to get attendance credit. I'll just go ahead and put that in for everyone. Um, what we're going to do for the first 15 minutes of class is just like an open Q&A on final project stuff. So if you've got questions about your final project, if you want to be like, hey, I'm working on this and this is what I'm doing. Does that sound reasonable? If you want to ask that kind of question, Friday is your time to do that. Um, you can do that if you want. Uh, are we allowed to use PowerPoint presentations? Absolutely. I, I think one of the things I'd like you to do is for the final project itself, see if you can go a little bit beyond just a PowerPoint. So maybe one way to do it would be to start with a PowerPoint and then give it like a verbal narration, right? You can build like a movie out of that or something like that. So PowerPoints are totally fine as a starting point, but see if you can kind of expand beyond it uh, for the, the final project. So first part of Friday's class, um, you can show up, ask questions. Me, I'll be here. The TAs will be here. <clears throat> and then what we'll do... Uh, for the rest of the class is the uh, the kind of people working on the honors project will meet in engage um, starting about 12 15 in that class and what I'd like to see out of you guys uh, is I'd like you guys to be able to put a few images of the model you've been working on into like a PowerPoint presentation and then within the engage kind of VR space I'll have each of you guys give kind of a presentation within that space so that's gonna be the plan for most of Friday all right, so no class Wednesday, class Friday is optional. Don't you guys wish just like the end of every year was like this, where like classes just start getting totally optional and show up if you want and maybe have one class a week? <laughs> really living the dream here. Um, but the final thing on the, uh, the announcements is the extra credit for the final project. And again, the way this is going to work is it is totally optional to present a little bit or a snippet of your final presentation, okay? Um, and what I would like you to do, if you're interested in doing that, uh, is sign up on the Google Sheet, which is under today's date on D2L. So go to D2L, content, Monday, April 19th, it's under module 14, and uh, go ahead and sign up there. Um, please don't erase people's names, sometimes that happens. Uh, once you write your name, you have to click out of the box for it to actually save your name in there. And really only sign up if you 
are pretty certain you do want to uh, indeed present. Um, we'll give you like five points extra on the, the project itself. So again, totally your call. If you don't want to present, that's fine. If you do want to show people what you've done, awesome. We'd love to see your contributions. All right. Uh, let's see. Other stuff. Is there a... Let's see. Okay. I answered for his question. Rory, is there a reading response due Friday? Rory, your reading responses are done for the semester, right? So if you hate reading, you don't have to do it anymore, <laughs> at least for this class. Um, yeah, no more reading responses. Do like go through and make sure that you've done them all. And like if you're missing any, get those in. The late policy is really good. You still get half credit if you're missing like a module three reading response. So do those, okay? Um, okay, uh, Jalen, uh, you were asking, can we make a voice thread with our presentation? I think a voice thread would be a fabulous way to kind of be able to build and narrate a, uh, a PowerPoint sort of thing. Um, so absolutely feel free to do that. You may have to find a way and, and work with your TA on this to make sure that they um, can access that. I'm not sure whether you need to set a permission or not, but work with them to figure that out. But I think that as a format would be great. Our final project, our group did a website. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Websites are cool. Again, you know, if you have multiple people doing it, really make sure that thing is nice and polished and looks like, well, let's make sure it looks better than D2L. <laughs> I don't know who designed D2L. <laughs> it is not a very intuitive website or easy to use. <laughs> anyway, that's just my end of the year complaining. All right, Tobin, you still have to do last week's uh, reading response. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm throwing shade at D2L. That's, that's just how I roll. Um, Tobin, yeah, get last week's in, man. You can still get like, uh, you can still get 70% um, if you get it in within a week. Okay, all right. So lots of exciting things. Uh, do pencil in, no class on Wednesday, right? Uh, that was built in since the beginning of the semester. Friday is totally optional. Um, if you wanna come here and chat for a little bit about the project, awesome. Um, if you don't, my feelings won't be hurt and we'll see you on Monday for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap where we were. Uh, you guys should kind of know the story by now, right? The, the Roman Republic begins because the kings in Rome were really, really bad. And it begins with this one ideology, right? Never again will a single person rule in the city of Rome. And for 500 years, it kind of sort of works, right? Especially towards the beginning. And then people start getting really, really strong and powerful, right? And we see this series of civil wars where the leaders in Rome start using Roman armies to go fight other Romans, right? And we see this numerous times. We get Marius and Sulla as the first people to use Roman armies to fight other Romans. And, you know, when you think about this, it kind of sort of makes sense in the sense that, like, when Rome, the Roman Republic started, right, it's really quite small, right? It's still just like this little city and a little surrounding area. And it's kind of totally fine to elect a consul for a single year, give them control of the army. Maybe they go 20 miles away and fight another tribe and then come back home. But 400 years later, we've seen the map of Rome, right? Like Rome is huge during this period in time. And so it's not a very efficient way to kind of govern to have somebody rule for a single year, to have them kind of become the general of the army for that single year, and then give up power the next year and let somebody else go do it. There's like a lot of like transaction costs in doing that in terms of retraining the army, starting new tactics, coming up with new strategies, all that stuff. So it kind of makes sense that like people like Marius become consul again and again and again because he's leading armies a thousand miles away from the city of Rome, right? Um, so you can kind of understand how and why that happens. But they're not the only ones who do this, right? Caesar and Pompey are at each other's throats fighting. And then Pom or Caesar defeats Pompey, but Caesar ends up getting a, uh, a couple stabs to, <laughs> stabs to the face for his troubles. Um, and then we've got uh, Mark Antony and Octavian as the kind of final two to, uh, to fight for control over Rome. And of course, hopefully you know by now, that it is our main man, Octavian, who wins this all, right? So he controls the West, and he controls the East, and Octavian controls North Africa. 
in Octavian for the first time in 500 years, right? A single person really does have control over the entire Roman Republic. And we've mentioned this a bunch of times now, right? We're lucky it was Octavian because he was really good at doing this. The kind of fundamental perspective or the fundamental strategy he adopts is to like on the surface restore the Republic, to treat the Senate with respect. In return, the Senate says, okay, you have all the real power. And we talk through the ways that he ends up ruling and consolidating and exerting this power, right? Treating the Senate well, symbolically restoring the Republic, doing a lot of things in terms of, um, in terms of like art and architecture to kind of, in literature, right? To start this kind of propaganda machine, talking about how much peace he has brought to the Roman world and how worthy Rome is to be the leader of the Mediterranean and how he's rightfully placed to be the one leading. And then also, right, uh, very um, practical sort of things too, right? Giving people more grain. So Octavian, what, what a guy, what a guy. Really, really good ruler early on. And he rules for 40 years. This is incredibly useful. By the time he dies, there are very few people left alive who remember what life was like under the Roman Republic, right? The new kind of Roman Empire is simply what people know. And then we get into the crazy Julio-Claudians, right? Tiberius just, he's the second Roman emperor and he just leaves Rome. He's like, nah, nah, I'm done. I'm scared of people. Everybody's out to kill me. I don't want to deal with this. So he builds a beautiful villa on the island of Capri. And if you ever go to Capri, you simply must visit the villa. It is very, very spectacular. You can see where he used to take people. Uh, and what he would do is then throw his enemies off the cliff. You can't really see it here. This is like a 400 foot cliff on the back side of this thing here. You can just take people and throw them right off um, in his little state of paranoia there. And we've got Caligula and Caligula's like, my horse Incitatus, you should be a senator. You're a great leader of men. Uh, and he lasts about four years and then gets himself killed by the Praetorian Guard. Claudius is all like, I just want to be a historian. And I'm like, I feel you Claudius, I want to be a historian too. And uh, he actually does a pretty good job as emperor, even though he's weird and his wives are terrible to him. And yeah, but he does a good job. He conquers Britain. Then we've got Nero setting things on fire, fiddling while Rome burns uh, and building this giant golden house in the, uh, the aftermath of that fire. And so what we learn, right, what we learn from the early emperors in Rome are that it doesn't take the most genius leader ever to have a successful Roman Empire. What it takes is good structure, right? The structure has got to be solid and in place. And then don't use your armies to kill other Romans. Just stop fighting with each other. Go fight little battles with the people on the outskirts of the empire, right? The kind of non-Romans, the barbarians on the outskirts. Quit fighting each other. You do that and you can be as wacko as you want as an individual. And it still works pretty well. So that's one of the main takeaway points. And then we looked at all this architecture, right? Somehow I forgot a slide of the Colosseum. I think I forgot that again. But one of the takeaway points here, right, is when the, the Roman Empire politically starts, right, with the first emperor, Augustus, it's been like, like economically and geographically, it's been an empire for like at least a century, like two centuries. Um, and at the start, right, with Augustus, it's almost at the furthest extent of the empire, right? So this is, you can kind of see the two versions. Augustus, 100 years later, Trajan. Yeah, Trajan's got like a little bit more, but it's, it doesn't grow that much after Augustus takes over. All right, I, don't, I gotta I find the cause, right? We talked through all the different... Um, architectural developments during the Roman Empire. Or at least, well, hold on, just hold on, hold on. What a good image here. I don't know, it's an okay image. We've got some, right, we've got the Colosseum. This is one of the early ones under the Flavians. Um, the Flavians are the dynasty that come up after the Julio-Claudians. 
And we normally call this, right? Ancient people called this the Flavian Amphitheater. And it gets its nickname, the Colosseum, right? After the statue that was outside of it, originally part of Nero's Domus Aria or Golden House. And then it becomes kind of adopted with a god's head. Uh, and it stays outside of the, the Colosseum, right? The, the building near the Colossus. Then we've got the Arch of Titus, right? Uh, which ends up uh, commemorating his conquest over the Jews. So we can see, right, them looting the second temple, carrying out the menorah. We've got Domitian at the end of the first century CE, building his stadium where Greek style athletic events would take place. Uh, and again, the kind of cool thing is that you can still see the shape of the stadium in the fabric of Rome today. We've got Trajan. He's often known as the best and greatest of all the Roman emperors by ancient Roman historians. Um, we see Trajan's column, right, with his conquest of the region of Dacia on there. And you can zoom in and the whole thing's, I mean, for being a massive column, this thing is incredibly detailed. Uh, in terms of the iconography on it. You can see different battle formations like the Testudo formation um, that helps protect them from projectiles both above and in front of them. Then we saw my all-time favorite, still all-time favorite like uh, building of the Romans, the Pantheon in Rome. This thing is just super cool, right? It's a temple to all the gods. It's built by the Emperor Hadrian. Um, as you can see, kind of the around 120 CE. But what you're gonna notice, we didn't talk about this last time, is um, it's got an inscription on the front. And any, can anybody, do we have any Latin people here? Um, can we translate what's, what's going on here? M. Agrippa, anybody know what M. Agrippa stands for? I'll give you a hint, M's a name. And Agrippa is also the name. <laughs> what do we think the M stands for? Mars? Good guess, good guess. So not the name of a god though. This is gonna actually gonna be the name of a, yeah, Marcus, that's exactly right. So we get the guy's name, Marcus Agrippa, and then we get LF, and L is an initial, also, for a Roman first name, and F is the word for filius, right, or son. So anybody uh, want to wager a guess as to what the L is? What Roman name that stands for? Lucius, that's exactly right, Madison. Um, so we have Marcus Agrippa, LF, filius Lucius, right? Marcus Agrippa, the son of Lucius. And then what we have here is his position. Uh, this is an abbreviation. C-O-S, um, any Roman political position that kind of sort of reminds you of? Consul. Yep, that's exactly right. The consul, uh, the consulship, and tertium. Any guess? That, that's kind of a, um, it has to do with numbers. It has to do with the uh, kind of number of times he was consul. Uh, any, any idea what the deal is there? Three, Three? you got it, right? Um, and then we get the verb at the very, very end. So F, uh, F E C I T. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you would know that one unless you've taken Latin, but any Latin people out there, anybody know what that stands for? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's simply like Marcus Agrippa, the son of Lucius, built this in his like third term as consul. And so there, there now you can go ahead and uh, when you guys go to Rome and you go to the Pantheon, you can translate the uh, inscription on the front. Um, but this gives you a couple things. One is this is pretty exemplary of what Roman inscriptions look like. So when you take Latin, learning Latin is only like half the battle. Because when you actually read the inscriptions, there's tons of abbreviations, right? Instead of writing out Marcus, they're just going to give you an M. Instead of writing out Lucius, you just get an L. Instead of saying the word son or filius, you just get F. Instead of consul, it's cos, right? Um, and so you kind of have to learn all the little conventions they use for abbreviations, but then you can actually start translating the stuff, which is pretty cool, right? Marcus Agrippa, the son of Lucius, built this in his third term as consul. Now, you might be wondering, 
Wait a second, you just said two minutes ago that Hadrian built this in 120 CE or so. And that is the case. So the original building, the original Pantheon was built by Marcus Agrippa. And Agrippa is like one of the really good friends um, of Augustus, the first emperor. So he's like, you know, this is like 150 years ago, um, 140 years ago, something like that, when the original version was built. Problem is, original version, made of wood, keeps burning down, burned down a couple times. But Hadrian, when he builds this version, is like a nice enough dude to actually put the original founder's name on the, uh, on the, the front of it here. So even though Hadrian paid for this and rebuilt it, and he put the original builder's name on the, the front. Um, and it really is like when you go to Rome, you, you got to go see it. It is so cool. Um, you go inside. It's also the burial place for uh, the most, the, the kind of founding king of modern Italy from the 1800s. So you can go see him buried in there. Uh, you can also see the artist Raphael. Uh, buried in the Pantheon as well. And then you can also see the largest dome in the world for 1,500 years. I mean, this thing is just so, so cool. It's made out of concrete. It's got this hole known as the oculus in the middle. That's like 30 feet wide. Um, the walls are like 30 feet thick. It's got these coffers in there, right? That's the name for those little indentations. And that's very, those are put there on purpose. Um, in order to lighten the, the weight of the, uh, the roof. So a really, really unique building, immaculately preserved because it got turned into a church. Um, and for 1,500 years, until you get the Duomo in Florence, which you should go, like, after you go see this, do you know, get on the train and then go to Florence and go see the Duomo because it is also awesome. And you can climb the stairs and you can actually climb the dome uh, of the Duomo and then look out over all of Florence from the top. And it's super sweet. Um, also, Florence, a Roman colony, uh, in large part founded, founded, founded by Julius Caesar. I think so. Um, but yeah, Florence, super cool. Okay, then we've got Hadrian's ma Mausoleum, right, which becomes Castle Sant'Angelo, the fortress to protect the popes in times of crisis. And we've got the statue of Marcus Aurelius um, up on the Capitoline Hill. And these buildings behind you. During the Renaissance, these were like state government buildings. They were built by Michelangelo, right? By like Ninja Turtle Michelangelo. And he's like painting Sistine chapels and he's like designing awesome buildings for the Capitoline Hill in Rome. So we've got a statue from Marcus Aurelius. We've got buildings from Michelangelo. Those buildings sit right on top of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the greatest temple in all of Rome. Um, and you can still see the foundations if you go into those buildings today, which you can totally do because it's now the Capitoline Museums. Remember that? Remember that? Uh, the like the bronze statue of the wolf that I was showing earlier with Romulus and Rebus? That's inside the, the museums here as well. So really, really cool stuff. And if you when you go to, to Rome, um, you want to... Uh, yeah, you can, you can basically track the whole history of the, the kind of Pax Romana, the, the main part of the Roman Empire, through the architectural remains that are, are left in the city. So what I'd like to do for the second half of today is talk through a few of the reasons why Rome was so successful, right? For 200 years, they are, you know, not only the most powerful kind of political um, state, in this part of the world, it also lasts a decent amount of time, right? For 200 years. Um, and it's the only time, right? This is the only time in history before Rome, after Rome, ever, that all of the Mediterranean is brought under a single political power, which is kind of interesting, right? Like this is the only time ever when that happens. So, so how does it happen? I'm gonna give you 10 reasons Feel free to jot down these reasons, and if you get any kind of questions about, you know, what were the strategies the Roman Empire used, or how did it become successful, then you'll have some ready-made reasons to go along with it. So first and foremost, you can't start this discussion without talking about the Roman army, right? At its core, the way that Rome expands its power is through military conquest. From the very, very first days, when we have Romulus, 
he's out there kicking butt against little tribes next to him. And as Rome goes on, uh, it continues to use that army um, to look in, like, kind of enlarge and enlarge and yeah, enlarge uh, the Roman Empire. And remember, when we talked about the army, we saw kind of a new strategy, right? With the Greeks, we talked about phalanx warfare, right? Remember the huge shields, it covers you, it covers half of your neighbor, half of you. You have to work as one to defeat the enemy. For the Romans, it's all about mobility, right? So they're built into these kind of cohorts and maniples within the larger legion. And what that allows for is lots of flexibility in battle. And that's one of the reasons they're able to defeat those Greek phalanxes and bring Greece and Macedon and those kind of regions from the Hellenistic kingdoms into the Roman world. So it's really strong. One of the things they're able to do is that they make it professional, right? So this was something that happened under Marius, that they turn the army into a professional organization where you sign up for a period of 20, 25 years. Afterwards, you retire, you get land, you get citizenship. There were a lot of benefits from being in the army. And what this does, right, is it does a couple things. One, it kind of prevents rebellion from regions that you might have already conquered. Uh, two, if they're on the outskirts of empire, it uh, deters invasion from the outside. Um, so it does both of those things. And then it also, if you push further, it allows you to build a bigger and bigger and better place. So the Roman army, first and foremost, huge part of what enables Rome to be successful. All right. Now, one of the other things is that basically from the time of Augustus, right, Octavian is able to defeat Antony and Cleopatra. And at that time, Egypt is brought into the Roman Empire. And that's like one of the last like large scales, or large scale enemies. For the next 200 years, the battles that Rome's fighting are like pretty small in scale. Like the enemies they're fighting tend to be like little tribes on the outskirts of the empire rather than major like battles against other large kingdoms. And that means a couple things. That's part of the reason why Rome doesn't gain a lot of other geographical area. Because there's no single battle they can fight in order to do that, right? It's all this little piecemeal stuff of little, little tribes. Uh, but it also means that there's not a major threat to Rome outside of... Yeah, there's not a major threat to Rome kind of outside of the empire itself. Uh, so most of the enemies at this time are fairly small on scale. And we can go back maybe a couple images here to the... Where is it? To the map, right? And we can kind of see when Augustus finishes up, right? We've already got Spain, we've got France, we've got Italy, we've got Greece and Macedon, we've got the majority of modern day Turkey or Asia Minor. Um, we've got the Levant, we've got Egypt, we've got most of North Africa. There's a little bit of North Africa left over here. Um, but by and large, right, you can think about what's beyond here. You get Britain up top, and Claudius eventually gets that. You've got desert down below here, right, in North Africa. Once you get below the area that's kind of already red, this is all like the Sahara. There's not like a lot to conquer down there. Um, over here in the east, you're also dealing uh, with kind of desert lands once you get into the Near East here. Um, and then the tribes up in Germany in this kind of area, they do give Rome uh, problems for a while, but it's, it's not an area that Rome ends up spending a lot of time on. So again, the... The kind of external enemies are fairly small in scale during the Pax Romana. Okay, now, we talked through how Rome was organized, right, during the Roman Republic, right? We've got the consul at the top, and then we've got the um, cursus honorum, right, the route of honors that people take to get to consul. Your quaestor, aedile, praetor, and then consul, and then afterwards you move over into the Roman Senate. Now. When we look at the Roman Empire, they've got to not just govern the city of Rome, they've got to govern the whole empire. And here's one of the big takeaway points about why Rome's successful, okay? They are able to do this using an incredibly small number of, like, political magistrates. I should have looked up, like, what the number was. I, maybe I can do that. Can somebody get me the number of, like, magistrates for... 
um, the Roman Empire in like, I don't know, under Augustus or in like 100 AD or something like that. Somebody find that for me. But the, the number's incredibly small. For the range that like Rome has, the number of people it has to govern, very, very small. And what this does, think about this, right? What this means is that what you're doing is you're putting a very, very light little like top layer on all these regions that are in your empire. You're not trying to change the entire thing from the bottom up. You're saying, okay, Google's saying 40, but Augustus reduced it to 20. Yeah, Google said 40, yeah, okay. Regardless of the exact number, something around 40, think about this. This is for Italy, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Egypt, North Africa. This is a crazy small number of people in charge of administrating like a huge empire, okay? And because of that, because of that light bureaucracy, it means that people's lives, right? Regular people at like the, the bottom levels, their lives like don't change all that much. So there's not like a huge reason for a rebellion if you're not changing your life that much, right? And so that light bureaucracy is something that really, really works in their favor. Now, if you ever do a comparative history class, uh, the Han Empire in China is a fabulous like kind of counter example to this. It's going on at like the same time. Spatially, it's about the same area. Uh, its administrative tactics are completely different. They have one of the most kind of developed and huge bureaucracies ever, right? You have like 10,000 administrators administering their empire against Rome's like 40 over here. Okay, so very, very light bureaucracy, huge area, small number of people to govern it. And this next point, um, the next point kind of builds on that, right? Uh, and the idea here, right, with this very, very light bureaucracy is that the way Rome is going to approach bringing in these areas, right, into the Roman world, right, into Roman control, is through this kind of process of trickle-down assimilation. So what they're going to do when they go into an area is they are going to look for the leader of that area. And they're going to be like, hey, you know what's awesome? Being Roman. <laughs> Here. What can we do to like influence you to uh, adopt kind of a Roman lifestyle, right? And whether that's Roman clothing or Roman architecture or Roman cultural habits, right? Uh, they are going to do what they can to flip those people who are already in control of all these areas at the very, very top. And then let those people, let them do the process of kind of converting all their own people to Roman ways of life. So rather than putting a Roman, you know, a huge number of Roman magistrates into all these areas and then having those magistrates and the army force Roman, you know, the local people to adopt Roman ways, they're just going to co-opt a couple people who are already in charge, incentivize them, right, give them money, goods, whatever it is, and then let them do the work in their own areas. And because of that, you can see kind of the Roman, uh, you know, Roman culture and Roman architecture and Roman artifacts all over the Mediterranean world, right? So this is from Croatia over here, right? We've got uh, something that looks almost exactly like the Colosseum all the way over in Croatia, over in southern France. This is the Maison Carré, right? One of the temples um, that looks exactly like a Roman temple in the south of France along the French Riviera. So that is kind of the strategy that Rome is using to bring all these areas under Roman power. And it works pretty darn well, at least for those couple hundred years. Now, in addition to that, right, imagine, you know, leaving Italy to go to Egypt. Imagine what that must have been like, right? If you're going from Rome into Egypt and you're starting to see these pyramids in the kind of Egyptian temples, this must have been wild, right? And one of the things that Rome does that makes it successful is that it's kind of totally cool with all these foreign influences, right? When the army's out east and they're encountering these different religions, they're like, the more the merrier, right? Let's take this religion and bring it to Rome. That would be a great addition to what we're already doing. What we're looking at here is a statue of the god Mithras slaying the bull. 
Um, and uh, Mithras is one of the uh, kind of gods or deities that comes from the, the east, um, kind of eastern part of modern day Turkey. And the Roman army brings it back to Rome and it becomes kind of an underground religion in Rome, Mithraism. And again, Rome is totally cool with this. What they want is they want you to pay your taxes, right? They want you to not cause problems. And they want you to like show your devotion to the traditional uh, kind of Roman gods and especially the, uh, the Roman emperor who becomes a god kind of during the, the course of the empire, right? And so you can kind of see, you know, if you're thinking in the back of your head, like, well, why are the Christians always, you know, persecuted or why were the Jews persecuted in, in early Rome? You can kind of see now why that's the case with monotheistic religions. Rome is totally cool with outside religions, but they still want you to kind of worship the traditional pantheon and especially the emperor. And so with things like Judaism or Christianity, those religions don't want to worship the emperor. And that's where you get the kind of conflict there, right? That's why uh, Rome can be incredibly cool if you want to bring Mithraism back or you want to worship Egyptian gods as well. But when it comes to, uh, you know, Christianity or Judaism, they're, they're less accepting in those areas. But this acceptance, right, um, is one of the things that made it kind of cool for people to join Rome, right? Like, if you're like, all right, my life doesn't change. I can still worship all the same gods I used to worship. Now I add one more little god in there that looks like the emperor. Again, it's not a, it's not uprooting people's lifestyles um, in a particularly dramatic way. Now I said, you know, one of the things that Rome wants you to do is pay taxes. And... It turns out that taxes, the, our best understanding right now, like taxes were relatively low. Anybody have any sense for, uh, for like what we pay in terms of taxes today? I always like asking this question. Um, what do you think we pay in terms of taxes today? Too much? <laughs> Too much. In, uh, oh, let's go with income tax. Yeah, so so those 7 8%, those are around sales tax, right? So it's all that 7 or 8% sales tax. And then, yeah, it ranges on um, on how much you make. But yeah, you guys are right, right? Like 20 to 30 to 35%, something in that range. Like a quarter of our income or more is going to end up going to taxes in, in one form or another. In the ancient Roman world, we're talking taxes to our best guess again, something like five or 10%, right? So they're paying less than half, right? And in some estimates they're paying like a quarter of what we would pay. And if all you have to do is pay 5% of whatever you're making and you can still worship whatever you want, you can kind of do whatever you want culturally. Again, there's just not a lot of impetus to try to start overthrowing things. Now, the taxes are also important for another reason, and I'm kind of sort of in the process of developing this class on the, the Roman economy because that's what I study, right? Um, but there's a cool theory that says the fact that you have taxes in Rome actually ends up helping everybody when it comes to economic growth. And here's the way that theory works. So the way it works is that by demanding taxes in coin, what that means is that you have to take your goods now to a market to sell it so that you can get coins in order to pay the taxes. So whereas before you might have just grown all your own stuff, right, and been self-sufficient, uh, now you're being forced to participate in the market, right? And not just in a bartering kind of way, right, training your grain for somebody else's cow. Now it's like more of a um, a more integrated market where you can specialize in whatever it is you do best, right? Grain or olive oil or wine or livestock, right? You sell that, you get the coins, you have to have the coins to be able to pay the taxes. Uh, and then when everybody specializes and everybody comes together into those markets, what ends up happening is that you get efficiencies that you don't have in smaller markets and things actually overall become a little bit cheaper because you're having the people who are best suited to doing a particular thing, right? 
going growing grain in Egypt or whatever, uh, doing that, and you're having people who are best suited, suited to growing wine or grapes in France doing that, and so you're getting kind of the best quality stuff at the best prices because of these integrated markets. <laughs> Throw all my money into Bitcoin. <laughs> Man, I... Ah, I can't believe I didn't buy Bitcoin a while ago. That that would have been, that would have been great. Anyway, um, okay, taxes. <laughs> yeah, the Dogecoin. Um, taxes were relatively low. Now, in addition to that, right, uh, this kind of gets to what we were just talking about. We also have common currency, which allows for those huge markets once, a, uh, once again, right, in the same way that I was de just describing, right, integrating large markets, allowing for specialization across the empire. Now, even if you have those markets, you still got to be able to get from point A to point B, and you got to be able to get your goods from point A to point B, and you do that easily in Rome because its infrastructure is so good, right? This road that we're looking at right here, this road is 2,000 years old. You can still see the old cart marks in the road. But guess what? I mean, this is, looks better than the road outside of my house right now. Um, these things were very well constructed um, and uh, they, they worked very, very well. Uh, in addition to roads, right, you have things like ports and harbors and things along those lines that allow for transportation, transportation and shipping. Um, movement of people and movement of goods across the entire empire. Now, I mentioned this a while ago, but none of this works without clean water. In terms of, of cities like Rome in particular, at its peak, Rome has something like a million people, right? Largest city uh, for, again, 1,500 years or something. And you do not get 1,500 people into a city, or sorry, a million people into a city unless you have clean water. And Rome's aqueducts, travel dozens of miles at the thing of like going down a couple inches per mile. Think of like the engineering that it takes to work with that, right? You have to be able to work over diverse terrains and then get that top level to just be going down a couple of inches over the course of a mile. It goes too fast, all the water's flying out. Uh, it goes too slow, it stagnates. Um, so you need the right slope. And they Rome has something like dozens of these, right? It's got like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 aqueducts all feeding into the city. Um, and one of the cool things is when you go to Rome today, they still got fountains all over that are fed by the aqueducts. You can go fill up your water bottle at one of these fountains. They just run continuously um, and you fill up your water bottle with aqueduct water, which is awesome. And one of the cool things is it can be really, really hot in Rome if you're there in the summer. You go get one of those like aqueduct fountains. It's like, it's like perfectly cold water coming out. It's awesome. All right, and finally, right, one of the reasons Rome works is because everybody agrees to imperial rule, all right? Like, again, the founding concept of the Republic was there is no king in Rome. There is no single ruler in Rome. And one of the reasons this all works is because both the leaders and the people are like, guess what? Maybe it's better to just have a single ruler than it is to keep fighting with each other and have this ideology of no single ruler. Um, so Romans stop fighting Romans. They agree to the idea that there will be one person in charge, and that allows for peace over an extended period of time. And I think this is kind of an interesting question um, in terms of, uh, you know, which is better, right? Is it better to hand over some of your freedom, right? Your ability to choose your leaders, but get some sort of peace in return? Or is kind of the bloodshed that like was associated with the end of the Roman Republic, is that a worthy price to pay to be able to vote for who you want uh, to be in charge? Um, and it's, you know, it's just kind of an interesting question and one to, to think about as we, we move forward. So let's go ahead and do our attendance for today. Uh, today's attendance is blue, so go ahead and put that in. I'll go ahead and extend this for another few minutes just to make sure everybody can get in on it.
Vanessa, time flies when you're having fun with ancient Rome. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think, you know, I think there's there's no point to, to start in the next thing now. Um, start working on your final project, right? Um, we didn't just finish today's class. We just finished the week, basically. Uh, so no class on Wednesday. Don't show up. I won't be here. I will be out eating lunch somewhere um, and uh, enjoying, yeah, enjoying the day off. Um, Friday, again, totally optional. Don't feel like pressured to come. If you do have questions or anything like that, I am here for you. Our TAs are here for you. We will help you in whatever way we can on Friday. Uh, honor students, do make sure you are here on Friday. Um, and we will spend the majority of the time kind of hearing about how your, your 3D development is going. I'm super excited to, to catch up on that. Um, yep, so, yep, Baron, blue is the color for today. Go ahead and get blue in there. Uh, once you've got that, you guys are out of here for the day. Go enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the rest of your day. I will see you either Friday or next week, and we will talk about how all of this comes crashing down. All right, everyone. That, that's it for today. Go ahead and put in blue, and I will see you uh, either Friday or Monday. All right. Have a good one, everyone.